I'd like to now um, introduce the moderator for our second panel on children and youth. Professor Yunsun Che is a professor at the Crown Family School of Social Work, Policy, and Practice. She seeks to understand the familial and environmental processes that influence and impact ethnic minority youth and young adults. One of her longitudinal studies examined Asian American youth and young adult development, as well as how parents can help to maximize developmental uh, potential, looking at the role of culture, racial prejudice and discrimination, ethnic identity and acculturation. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Professor Yunsun Che. Hi, everyone. You guys don't get to have a break. <laughs> <laughs> so, as it was introduced, the session is on youth and uh, ch children and youth, um, as they are often the most marginalized members of a society, and particularly if they experience deprivation in the form of poverty, disability, racial ethnic um, status, minority status, and gender inequality. <clears throat> so the US and China have varying provisions to address the needs of the vulnerable children. And the panel will explore some of the current issues facing the young people in each country and some of the policies and supports provided and the enduring challenges and potential solutions to them. <clears throat> And I have posed two questions to the panelists to introduce their work. And the two questions were, what has motivated your work? And what were the major issues facing young people that you address in your research? And what are the policies, social service provision, or programs that, you, uh, that serve young people in your area of work? So each panelist will respond to these <clears throat> two questions. And our panelists include uh, Professor Gao from Peking University, Department of Sociology, and uh, Professor Yasui at the Crown School, as well as uh, Professor Curtis McMillan from also Crown School. <clears throat> and all the details about their excellent bios are on the website, so we're going to save that um, the time here. So, Professor Gao, do you want to go first? Uh, sure. Thank you, and uh, very glad to join this panel discussion. As Professor uh, Yongsen discussed on this Tuesday, I'd like to uh, have some background information about the uh, discussion in China and to have a brief introduction about my own research uh, and to, uh, to, to learn and also to share with you about the concern the impacts of pandemic. So for China, the information I'm going to address uh, include the, demo, the basic demographics and uh, the second is about the policy framework and the, some basics about the social services. And in terms of demographics, um, the most recent uh, community of the seventh national population census show that we actually in terms of the percentage of the uh, people who's 14 years old and younger, uh, it's very close to the percentage of people who's 60 years and uh, uh, older. Um, so uh, you, I, I don't know whether the audience have some, uh, get some news about the, the Chinese government and also the public uh, has a great concern over the population growth. So we have some policies to uh, to release the uh, birth control. Uh, the birth control policy can trace back to the late 1970s and the early 1980s, uh, which is so-called one-child policy. And uh, in some areas, actually, uh, the policy is uh, not so 
so um, strict. And for some populations, they, uh, they especially the minorities, they have the uh, they can have more children than one. Okay, so um, when we talk about the uh, demographics, one concern is about the the, the natural growth. Another uh, concern is about the uh, the age structure and also the gender ratio. Um, personally, uh, myself uh, is trying to to figure out after the uh, the new policy, new uh, childbirth policy, what the gender ratio is going to be and what impacts on especially girls uh, in terms of their the, like the um, healthcare and also educational opportunities and futurely the employment opportunities. Um, and in China, the uh, foundation, the, the background is we have a uh, huge variations in the economic background and the social services resources across uh, east coast, the middle, the west, and the east, east north. And a lot of the research has a has a emphasis on the uh, rural areas. The so we have the national agenda, especially to to um, so-called the poverty reduction agenda, which to end the absolute poverty by 20, by, by two, uh, 20, uh, 20, so which, which is last year. And uh, the new agenda is to, uh, to achieve the, um, the, the to, to, to share the economic growth together with the, uh, the rural citizens and uh, uh, to, redesign the, um, we, we say to uh, the economic growth and also the uh, countryside development in a new area, a new agenda. But anyhow, um, so that's, uh, yeah, I, I think, I don't know whether you can see the picture here. So at no, at no any point there, well, okay. <laughs> yeah, because I have a picture to show that the uh, developed uh, status like the city in Beijing and in some mountain mountainous area actually uh, for people over there they are lack of the uh, resources not, not not necessarily the employment opportunities but also screen share I, yeah so um, but also like the social services so we have an unbalanced dis distribution of the social work agencies. So which is more or less because uh, the social work agencies, they need the funding, but uh, the funding actually, the richer uh, areas have the uh, stronger financial capability to support the social work agencies. So you can see that uh, for people in the rural areas and the less developed areas, they may have the uh, more urgent needs of the social work or social services in general, but uh, uh, lack of the resources in this way, um, but I do see some programs, some some social work programs, which uh, they they try to balance the problem or the uh, gap smartly. For instance, we have lots of the uh, left behind rural left behind children, and their parents actually working in the city areas. So some of the social work uh, programs they provide the parenting. Uh, classes or lessons, uh, such as to the construction workers. Ah. Okay, so I'm running out of the time. I think I get the message, but uh, so I <laughs> try to try to go fast. Uh, so in terms of the policy from frameworks, we have uh, from the tour perspective, we have the subsidy policies and some in pro uh, in kind programs, including like childbirth insurance. And we do have like one child allowance, which uh, the amount is low, but it's like the like a symbolic policy. And we have the social social. Um, so in the rural areas, uh, a new program called the Belfield Social Worker. Uh, they try to provide the uh, frontier social work services for those children, who especially for the uh, rural left left behind children. And we have a new policy which. Uh, can exempt part of the income from the taxation if you had a, a ch school children. Uh, so this is a, uh, the tour perspective. And from the needs per perspective, uh, we have some progress in terms of the child protection uh, and also 
uh, some of some uh, the symbol in the administration is we have the child bureau seminar or the uh, section of the uh, child protection or child welfare services in the Ministry of Civil Affairs. And then recently, actually, uh, some of the issues got more attention, like uh, the mental health and employment uh, for the youth. Um, okay, so that's about the. Uh, so uh, if I, if we take a look, that we can see that economic growth plays a significant role in the development of the child uh, related policies. And uh, the uh, right perspective, that social welfare right, uh, the coverage need to be uh, more equal and uh, to be more in inclusive. And the, the, in terms of policy skills and experience uh, contribute to the development. And the uh, we can see a lot of uh, emphasis, emphasis on the child issues in recent, both the policy, the public discourse, and also academic research on children. Um, one of the very significant reasons is about the fertility, fertility rate concern. Um, so for the future, uh, I think the challenge is to improve the quality of the policy, policy, sorry, policy design and to develop the more scientifically and the feasible practical knowledge. And another challenge is to have uh, the involvement of the local communities no, no matter in the urban or in the rural areas, because it's uh, from the policy and also the social social services, the feature you can see a strong top-down uh, character. And uh, for the local communities, we have the relative more passive uh, uh, involvement. Um, so my, my own research now, uh, one is about to figure out the rationale of care policies in in the China, like the policy documents and the policy makers and the, uh, the different perspectives of researchers because some, some emphasize from the child perspective, like uh, children's right and child well-being, but some more emphasize uh, from the uh, female's perspective, like the, the, uh, whether it's going to give the female extra broad burdens in terms of you emphasize a lot of the, like the quality, the safety, and also the future development of children and the mother, you need to, you know, um, and another thing is we have the uh, new policy just elected, which is a family education policy. So it, this actually is quite new, but the uh, from the legislation perspective, it's a very fast uh, uh, legislation uh, process. It's a very special case. Um, okay, so... Um, Professor Choi asked us to uh, share some uh, discussion about the impacts of the pandemic. So I think uh, the one concern is uh, about the technique. So from the positive perspective, the tech- Sorry, tech sorry to interrupt, but we will save that response later because okay. we have okay. the time for it later. <laughs> I know it's a challenge to summarize your work in five minutes. like. You spent all those years doing the work, and we ask you to talk about your work in five minutes. Sorry. And also, the PowerPoint that you have sent has really nice contrast to the big development in the big city and the, the reality of the rural area. And it's unfortunate that we can't share that with you, but <clears throat> you can use your fantastic imagination, the contrast. Um, so, uh, so, after this summary, we will move on to Professor Yesu's work. And then also uh, Professor McMillan's work, and then we'll go on to the next question and COVID-related questions. Okay. All right. Um, well, um, in terms of the questions of what motivated my work, I think that comes from um, the challenges, particularly the population that I work with, is Asian American immigrant um, children and families, um, as well as um, families of color. And within the United States for decades, there's been just evidence that really shows that particularly communities of color underutilize mental health services. Um, it's actually been over five decades now that this data continues. And that despite mental health needs, um, African Americans, uh, Latinx, um, Native Americans, Asian Americans underutilize mental health services. And this is something that is actually not just with children and families, but actually across the board in terms of children, adults, and the elderly as well. 
And so this pattern really speaks to the wide mental health disparities um, that really is kind of divided by race um, in the United States and is really a continuing problem. Um, the, there has been efforts, I think, at various level from the grassroots above to even um, kind of policy level. And we see this even in our own funding as, um, for, uh, for research as well. But I think that this whole aspect of mental health disparities and how um, racial divisions occur is something that has been an area where I really want I, my research is trying to capture. And in particular, um, my work centers on the role of culture. Um, obviously, there are many aspects in terms of why populations may underutilize mental health services when we think about logistics, um, aspects of insurance, uh, cost. Um, language barriers, um, access in terms of um, where healthcare services, mental health care services are located. Um, but I think one of the areas that are often more amorphous in terms of understanding is how does the cultural values, beliefs, and traditions actually impact the ways in which people think about mental health and how they end up um, seeking the services that are necessary. And so my line of work has really tried to um, understand this. I'm still, I would say, humbly still in the midst of this and trying to understand this with the Asian immigrant populations. But my work has really tried to understand what are the ways in which particularly Asian immigrant families think about what mental health is. Here in the United States, as um, in the Foreman panel um, also mentioned in terms of healthcare, there's a divide in terms of healthcare and mental health care. Even in our insurance system, it's divided. And so there's this conceptualization of health versus mental health, kind of this um, dual approach. And yet, quite interestingly, on a goal, when we look at worldwide, the way that uh, mental distress is actually understood, how it's experienced, is not really this divide of the mind versus um, the body. It actually is more holistic, that there is a mind, spirit, body element that and that is how people think about their well-being. And so when you think about how, if people are thinking about this stress in this way, it also impacts the ways in which they actually experience it. Um, here, when we have, let's say, a screener for depression, there are questions that may be asking about how we feel. There might be some questions about how it affects our body, um, but much of what, um, current mental health field focuses on is emotion, also co cognitions, what goes through our mind, and then our behavior. Um, and yet, quite a number of um, populations actually experience their mental distress much more what we call somatically. So instead of feeling sad and down, they might actually have a headache or shoulder ache, or it might be neck pain. And so because different populations uh, actually experience mental distress in a very different way, current systems and assessments of how mental health is actually um, identified may not be really the, the appropriate approach for different populations. And so that's exactly where kind of my work is trying to understand, particularly with Asian immigrant populations, what does it look like? So my work is kind of try to uncover what are the ways in which um, particular groups, so the uh, communities that I work with are Chinese, Cambodian, and Lao um, communities here in Chicago. And my work has tried to understand what are the ways in which they express their distress? What are the sayings they say? What are the ways in which they ex uh, experience it somatically? Um, how do we capture that so that we are actually um, assessing their accurate level of distress? How do we then think about the ways in which they actually think about their distress? Um, how do they conceptualize it in terms of what it is? Do they think of it as a mental health problem or do they think of it as stress or, or actually more of a physical problem? Understanding this would be really critical in, all, in order to understand what, what might be the particular health-seeking sources they find and whether or not that leads itself to mental health services. So the challenge here, particularly with um, communities of color and particularly with the communities that I work with, is that while we have mental health services, um, and obviously, as noted, there's a lot of logistical barriers that uh, may prevent um, 
people from accessing. But even if it was available, one of the things is that they may not understand that they have mental health um, uh, problems or it, concerns, and that mental health services is not even in even in kind of their um, in their vicinity in terms of how they think about help seeking, and so. I think that is one challenge where actually we see data that links itself to this underutilization. And quite interestingly, um, Asian Americans are actually the least utilized mental health services out of all racial groups. Um, and so I think this is something that has really affected the Asian American population. In addition, um, with the population here, particularly with immigrant families, there's this divide between how the children understand mental health because they have been, they have grown up here in the United States. They have the language of what depression is, anxiety is. They understand what mental health service is because they have these services within the schools. Their parents who migrated and who, may, who are first generation do not have the same understanding of mental health because they're under, how they were uh, raised and how, how they understood mental health is very different. It's from their cu culture of origin. And so even within the home, it's not just in the, in the communities. You see in the homes that you see this divide of understanding of mental health. And that, unfortunately, um, has lent itself to um, conflict and tension, but also difficulty, particularly for the young people, in being able to express their struggles as well as um, seek the services that are necessary. Um, and I can go more into terms of the other, like later questions in terms of particular cultural values, um, practices that may um, actually become barriers or might, might facilitate things. But I think this also has been um, an issue in terms of even with the availability, um, people, young people, because of concerns of um, particularly how their parents might view them if they utilize mental health services or stigma from the community, that has resulted in the underutilization even among um, Asian American young adults. And so this, I think, also um, has is related to kind of uh, rates of internalizing problems, depression, anxiety, and also to note just with um, suicide, Asian American, particularly young women, are one of the highest groups. And so you can kind of see this link in terms of how culture kind of plays its role, also in terms of the utilization um, despite the need. So, hi. Um, so I've spent my career sort of at the intersection of the child welfare system in the United States and the mental health system. So I've worked as a foster care case worker. I ran a treatment foster care team pulling kids out of residential care. I've worked in residential settings, which are in the US set where we send the most behaviorally challenged kids in the country. Um, and I've worked in inpatient psychiatric services. Um, so the, the population that most intrigues me and that I think about all the time are what we maybe unfortunately call high-end kids. Um, so when I was, I was doing a research project a few years ago that took me to different residential centers, um, and I was, I was charged with talking to people about their physical restraint practices, their, how they held kids down um, when they were upset. And every facility, there, there were the, I would talk to the executive director, and the executive director would say, well, you don't understand, Curtis. We get the kids that have been kicked out of every other facility in the state. And I'd go to the next facility, and they'd say, you don't understand, Curtis. We get the kids that have been kicked out of every facility in the state. And that happened over and over and over. And I went back and I looked at the data, and they were all right. They all accepted the kids who had been kicked out of every facility in the state. Those kids, the subset of kids in the foster care system was just cycling through every facility and every type of service that the state had to offer. When I started a treatment foster care program that was, took kids who were not succeeding in residential care for a long period of time, like two and three years and not getting better and pulling them into treatment foster care programs, the first kids that we got had 30 prior placements, 40 prior placements. I remember when I worked in a group home, um, the last kid that I admitted into the, the group home before I left to go get my PhD had had 14 prior placements since April, and it was June. Oh. So this, this population that most intrigues me are these kids who, whose lives are just churning at this just incredibly awful way. 
and, and the policy <coughs> solutions that we tried to craft um, to, to try to solve this dilemma, and no state has. And so I've been trying the last 10 or 15 years to solve this myself, and I have failed miserably as well, I should say, as has everyone who has come before me. Um, it's really interesting from a policy perspective. Um, child welfare funding is super complex. The money comes from lots of different places um, with strange eligibility criteria. The, most, the, the biggest funding source for child welfare services is 4E funding, and the eligibility criteria for that um, were for a program that ended 25 years ago, but they still have a 35-page checklist that you go through to determine whether a child can help draw down federal for Social Security $40. Most of the, of the high-end funding comes from Medicaid, which is a bit unfortunate as well, um, which is already Medicaid we've already talked about tonight, but I dare you to go find a child-serving psychiatrist who accepts Medicaid, not just in Chicago, but almost anywhere. Um, it's sometimes hard to find a, a psychiatrist <coughs> at all um, who, will serve, who will serve children, let alone these like super high need kids. Wow. I, I worked as a foster care worker as well, and I can't imagine placing a kid 14 places in two months. So we hear all this uh, young people struggling and have challenges, and we're still with the COVID pandemic. And I would like to ask the panelists how the pandemic has complicated even more uh, the challenging lives of the young people that you research, and also whether there were unexpected positive outcomes or strength that you have seen in them. Do you want to start, Professor Gao? Uh, okay, thank you. I think, uh, yeah, I actually found it very interesting two professors shared about their <laughs> vision. So, but anyhow, uh, in terms of the China experience, I think um, the key, so start from the challenges. Uh, one is about the funding because in the past 10 years, we have a very fast development in terms of the child-related policies and the services. Um, so if the funding has some uh, you know, difficulty, uh, especially like the Belfort, Belfort uh, social workers in the rural areas. Um, so my worry, I think that the government is trying to secure because the, actually this, uh, the monthly salary, the amount is not from our perspective is should be, uh, how to say, um, feasible. Uh, but the thing is uh, many other social programs which were designed whether there is a chance to uh, develop in future. Uh, another concern about the social connections and the communications. Uh, uh, so for 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 the uh, so current the um, major way to uh, prevent the spread of the disease is to uh, lock down some community communities or some uh, cities once they find some uh, positive cases. So in this case, uh, the crisis is about like the children, for example, in the boarding school in the rural areas, what's going to uh, like the services and the protections. Um, so we have some research about the uh, bullying in the boarding school uh, among those who were left behind children. And, um, but we do not have very updated uh, uh, report yet. Uh, from the positive perspective, I think, is about the technology because um, uh, the tracking system and also uh, like the uh, a lot of information actually can be delivered through the like WeChat and some uh, tiny communication uh, facilities. And this pro provides another channels for those less developed, for, for children, uh, living in the less developed areas because we have some special programs, philanthropy and the uh, the the special top down uh, transfer, financial transfer to uh, establish the local technology uh, facilities, so which can can uh, balance part of the uh, service uh, insufficiency in those areas. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think for um, the pandemic obviously has affected everyone. And I think one of the things um, 
I'll start kind of with the positive overall is that I think the pandemic has actually brought to more awareness the role of mental health and how everyone, it does, is something that everyone is, uh, it has been impacted by COVID. And so I think that has been something that I have found, um, even with my work, to be, wasn't, I guess, surprising, but it was something that I found um, a positive finding. Now, the pandemic, I think, has really impacted, it's not just Asian um, immigrant populations, but I think overall, young people. Um, when we think about the, the importance of interaction in the social development of children, um, having that whole, now, it's still continuing, but almost two year period where, things had to be remote. Um, and this is beyond the particular group that I study, but um, even in Chicago, but many of the children um, here in the Chicago public schools, they had to go remote. Um, and that experience was, it really impacted them in, in so many ways. With the, um, with the people that I study, the social isolation was perhaps the, the most, um, Troubling, um, particularly when the pandemic started, um, having to suddenly become remote. Um, for young adults who had just gone to college, they had started to become independent and then they had to go back and be home. And so you can see how even developmentally, this is, there's such a shift and they go to college, they are starting to um, live with other people, develop their own kind of sense of really in autonomy and then they're pulled back into their home environment. And so in some of my, um, the interviews that we have done with young adults, um, there was increased family conflict that occurred because um, that going back home required in some ways like families to fit back into their roles and the young adults who had now developed felt um, like they, they, they were no longer the child that they were when they had left before. And so this led to some conflict. But on the other hand, some of the positive findings was that, in fact, um, the pandemic allowed the families to come together. And I think one thing I'll note is particular, um, more unique to the context of the US, is for Asian Americans, the pandemic really has also had not just a layer of, obviously, you know, we have a worldwide pandemic occurring, but the racism that occurred. And it has been, it has significantly impacted the Asian American community. Um, we, the level of hate crimes has um, increased, dis um, just discrimination, racism all across the board in terms of from strangers to um, people they knew. It was just the instances really rose and it really affected the mental health of young Asian American adults. And for many, <clears throat> they were afraid to go out. Um, many actually felt that they would be, they would be um, attacked either in public or even online. And I think the, they were, the downside of being on social media, particularly for uh, young people, is that there was a lot of um, both, it was actually both positive but also very negative. They received um, racism online but also what the other positive aspect was there were also support. So there were people who were in solidarity with them. And so you can kind of see that not only in kind of their, in their physical environment, but in this kind of virtual environment that they were having kind of to navigate relationships with people um, as they were trying, also trying to figure out their own um, uh, kind of positionality as well. And I think that for Asian American young adults, with the Black Lives Matter movement also. This also kind of um, really kind of brought young adults to kind of think, question and think about what does it mean to be Asian American? What does it mean to be um, a person of color? Um, how do we think about racism within um, the structure of the United States? And so I think one of the really positive findings, particularly among the young adults, was really this increased sense of wanting to understand better what it means to um, pursue a just world, what does it mean to be Asian American and also um, be an ally to my black brothers and sisters. And so I saw many young people actually really take the steps to, to educate themselves. They were the ones who actually um, partnered with community organizations or churches and were involved um, 
in either demonstrations or um, protests. And also, the other finding that I found was some of them actually had these conversations with their parents, which really is not the easiest thing. Um, some of those conversations did not go well, and so then some of the young adults said, well, you know, we'll kind of leave it at that. But for others, it actually opened up the conversations where the parents themselves then started to share their own experiences of racism that they had never told their children. And so I think it really led to a moment of kind of understanding what does it mean to be here um, as being seen as a foreigner, being treated always as a foreigner, um, and now, you know, what does that mean to us? And so I think those family conversations were particularly important for the young people um, who had those. Um, in, the, in the first panel tonight, um, Dr. Pollock was talking about low-wage workers. And in the population that I deal with, um, it's often low-wage workers who are asked to care for the most challenging kids, especially in these residential treatment environments. So you can imagine being a low-wage worker, being asked to deal with the most challenging kids in the entire state for low pay during the middle of a quarantine while you've got your own kids at home. So one thing we found in the child welfare system is like in other sectors of care, just a huge workforce challenge. How do you get people to take those jobs? How do you retain people in those jobs? Um, I'm told that it, in Illinois, at DCFS, they're in a, a record um, workforce crisis and that the retention of their workers is at a, is at a terrible rate, once again. Um, and yet they're having a hard time getting new caseworkers to come in at a time in Illinois where foster care entry is going up. So what do we know nationally about the child welfare system in, in, the, in the pandemic? We know a few things. Adoptions plummeted. Adoptions like the only really good outcome we have in the child welfare system went way down. Reunifications, children returning home to their families. The others like outcome we hoped for went way down. Um, largely, that was because we think that there were that court, family court hearings just weren't happening, and, and those things require a judge, you know, saying that these things can happen. Um, we, in some states, foster care entries went way up, in other states, they went way down. So, make sense of that for me. But we also know that the child maltreatment rates, reported rates to child abuse hotlines, went way down. But nobody thinks that child maltreatment went way down because people were stuck at home in quarantine and, and tempers were flaring everywhere. So it's suspected that child maltreatment probably went up. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting sort of like <coughs> traumatic, and drama traumatic and dramatic sort of picture of the havoc of the child welfare system. Um, I'll stop there. Yeah. Yun Sun's given me the look. No, I wasn't giving you the look. <laughs> I was actually having the reactions to what you're saying, because you know, I think we probably, I mean, you all probably have a lot to say and ask, because I think all three panels have shared very strong stories and you know, concerns and also the unexpected positives and strength coming out of them. But just hold on your question, because I have another question to ask the panelists, and I know we're, we're probably running a little bit over time. But another question that I want to ask the panelists is that, you know, U.S. and the China have very, I mean, the children and young people in each country have a very different needs and conditions and circumstances. And each country also has responded very differently, naturally. The, one of the purpose of the, the forum here, what do we learn from each other? So that would be my last question to the panel. Do you want to start with? With it, uh, Professor Gao. Um, yeah, I really thank the professors sharing about the information in the states because we actually learn a lot. Of, uh, you know the lessons from and myself training the states. But um, this actually uh, encouraged me to think about the, the contribution of the our new parent, uh, which called family education law. So. My, my own perspective is, is a strong intervention from the state into the private areas. Um, of course, we have different mechanisms to respond to the child abuse or neglect cases in China. So we actually developed quite, quite late 
the uh, government intervention in these areas. Um, however, now the the at, at least from the um, the government perspective, there is a need to to provide some guidelines for some you know especially uh, no income families and also some families has uh, uh, challenge issues about uh, how to deal with you know or to try to to moderate the parent and child relationship uh, actually the work is going to happen in the school so um it's it's quite new because uh, actually I was invited to do, uh, have the discussion about the uh the draft of the the law but it's passed uh, in one week before the discussion so it's quite a very fast and it, you can see that the uh the the ang- anxiety or anxious or uh, what I don't I don't know how to describe but adding how comparing with many other uh, legislation process is quite uh, a fast way in Ch- in the uh, Chinese case. Another thing is, um, although we have the concern about the sustain uh, sustain uh, whether it can be continued in a long way, but so far uh, we have the governmental financial uh, support, which together with the minimum living allowance toward the uh, you know like the in the countryside and, and also in the urban side. Um, so, so far it's place to provide some uh, basic living support uh, toward the families. I think maybe, mm-hmm. you know, it's like the, um, to prevent the very uh, dramatic crisis happen. But the thing is how, how long the government can continue the support. That's the case. Yeah, thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, I think particularly with my area of work, but because it looks at the role of culture, um, really understanding um, how mental health is understood within um, China, I think would be something that's, I, actually I have drawn from work that has been um, published from um, China and Hong Kong as well, and I think that's something that I have really found to be um, really helpful in understanding kind of the the ways in which culture really shapes the ways in which people think about mental health. Um, I think the role of, um, Professor Gao, you had mentioned how actually technology has been something that actually has been a positive outcome that you have found. And I think that that's something um, within particularly the young population that I have found that it's actually on social media or through whether it be WeChat or here it's um, Facebook or Instagram, that actually they're getting the information about mental health for the first time and they're sharing it. And it's actually not with, let's say, their family members, but it's with one another or even people that they didn't know. Um, So I think that role of um, kind of social media and technology is something that I'm finding quite universal in terms of how mental health is now being kind of disseminated. Um, I would definitely be curious to see if similar, if something similar is also happening um, in China, whether, let's say, conversations about mental health may be more easily kind of put up on um, things like WeChat. I know that here that's more, that seems to be more the case um, with Asian immigrant populations, and they re- even have uh, like Facebook groups that are specific to that, where a lot of people will go to and kind of commiserate in terms of their experience of of struggling with mental health issues and yet, oh, my family doesn't understand or my my family would just say, oh, it's just like a teenage thing or, you know, just work harder or study harder. Um, And I think that sentiment, I think, is uh, that among the Asian um, groups that they have found um, to resonate with. And one group, um, one face group group, I think is actually worldwide um, and that, it's quite interesting to see actually globally the experiences of Asian families in which kind of this this gap between how the young people are experiencing mental distress and how the parents are kind of responding to it, there seem to be some similarities. Um, so that's something that I think would be really interesting to have kind of further conversations about. So n- nobody's really built a child welfare system that we think really works yet. And so China is in the, the business right now of, of <laughs> professionalizing a child will workforce at a very huge scale. Um, and so it's going to be interesting to see how that works and how, how they figure that out. I understand 
one of the ideas is they're going to have a child welfare, they call them directors, in every small village in rural China. That's really interesting to me. And, and um, comparatively, um, there are, the child welfare systems look very different everywhere. And we probably all have something to learn from everybody. At this university, lots of travelers come through the world. And a couple years ago, I, I sat down with a woman who was a foster care worker in Sweden. And I was talking about this churn issue of these high-end kids who you know, have 30 placements. And she said, that doesn't happen in Sweden. And it happens in all 50 states here. Um, so there's, there's lots of stuff that we can learn from each other. Um, I just don't know what they all are. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank you so much. So we will now give you, the, the audience, a chance to ask questions. And just, just as a sort of the precautions, although many of us here are sitting are clinicians or used to be clinicians, <laughs> We can't really consult in the, on individual cases or your neighbor's cases, having anxiety attack or something to that nature. Um, so we'll start with um, some of you, if you have questions to the panel about what they have shared or new questions. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah. The mic is coming. It's coming. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering, you know, the similarities and differences in resources from the government, right? So I think in the prior panel, on this panel, there is a clear demarcation between accessibility, and that seems to be driven by personal wealth or lack of it. Mm. So the government plays a regulatory body for, the, for society to help us balance that inequality through, a, through assignation of taxation to different programs. So in your experience, what has been the evolution, past, present, and future that you are seeing developing on the role of the government in balancing health, especially to children welfare? Thank you. Well, uh, in the, it's interesting in the child welfare world that um, federally, Congress has been fairly responsive to the needs of, of, of the child welfare system and children and families. And there's been a series of legislation that's been e sort of pro progressively improving the child welfare system over the past 50 years. Um, and it's had bipartisan support, which is rather incredible. Um, I mean, like some of the most conservative people in Congress, like Dick Armey, was a, was a was a huge proponent of properly funding the child welfare system in, in the United States. Um, he was he had been a foster. He and his wife had been a foster parents. Hmm. Um, and so, part of my world is these older kids in the foster care. It's like three major pieces of legislation, each improving access to services for older kids in the foster care system so that now in many states kids can get like housing support for example until age 23 or when i started work, that work and ran a transitional living program in oklahoma in the 1980s every kid was out of care at 18 and there was nothing like you didn't get a penny of anything um, after your 18th birthday so and their tuition support is now available um, federal money, state money, and a good deal of philanthropy money for kids in the foster care system. So in, in my world, the policy structure and the accessibility has actually been continually improving. So I, think I, know, I know you don't, no one wants to believe that. Right. <laughs> but that might have been a bit of exception. But then with the COVID, you know, the, the President Biden just signed more of the extensive social, social sort of the program type. and. So things could be changing here. There was money well. in the second big COVID relief bill specifically for young people who'd recently left the foster care system. They could get up to $2,000 for housing and income, income support. That's rather, I mean, it's rather stunning that people thought to include the small population of people who'd recently left the foster care system as young adults. Right. Do you want to? No. Because <laughs> funding is terrible for Asian American areas. That I can tell you. Um, so, Professor Gao, do you want to ha um, add something to this conversation? I know, I mean, China again has a very different system, 
right, than what we have here. Yeah, I think uh, actually we have some uh, communications with the U.S. scholars about the child welfare uh, system. So uh, we got some advice to avoid, you know, like to uh, the 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 children transfer from different uh, foster care families or from different institutes and uh, uh, to establish a more, um, how to say, the effective and the more uh, beneficial system for the children. So we are, we are still in the, at the early stage, but you can see that the, um, the, the emphasis is about to, to make the, how to say, analysis about the kinship care and also the care in the local community. Um, so this is one thing. And the, the attention was uh, uh, dragged a lot by some events happened uh, among the left behind children, actually. So a lot of the attention uh, from the uh, financial perspective, I think, and also the policy progress uh, more respond, uh, clearly respond to the, the needs of the left, left behind children. Um, and the uh, professor mentioned about the mental health concept in the Asian community. And I want to share in recent years, uh, I do see some change in China because we have some uh, crisis like the suicidal events happened and got the uh, broad report in the media and get a lot of attention in the parents. So we do see lots of parents, they have the questions about the mental health issues and we, we see some the policy advocacy and also some analysis and some uh, policy uh, manuscripts, the drafts address the mental health issues in, in the, uh, uh, the child group. And also uh, the school social work is under uh, development in China now and they want they want definitely want to take the. This is going to be a major concern, um, and the, um, and the, I think uh, yeah, some 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 idea just think about way. But um, I think the thing is uh, we have we we do have a very strong uh, state role in this. Uh, so now it seems like an opportunity for the less developed. Uh, populations to get some social resources. Um, and uh, some of the, I think, challenges or troubles may may well be uh, shown in future, like the U.S. is no, like the agencies, some conflicts, or uh, it's, I think it's, uh, we can take a look and uh, to try to put in the policy analysis. Yeah. And uh, uh, about the uh, services toward the child groups, I think the, uh, when Professor Qutis mentioned about uh, how to find the psychiatrists, the professional psychiatrists in the services, I think this is uh, in a high demand of the, uh, the, the, the resources in China too. So we are trying to figure out the core um, knowledge of child social work and uh, also to establish uh, effective connection toward other professionals. So when they de design the, the so-called Belford social workers in the uh, countryside, actually it's kind of like a mixed, mixed part of the traditional uh, administra administrative work to figure out what the policies can help those children and to uh, integrate some of the uh, the practical knowledge and the skills, but the human resources actually from the local community. So uh, recruit the uh, country, especially ladies in the uh, village and uh, going to be the one who, you know, walk around in the families. And uh, um, actually they not only play a role in the child protection and social services, but also I think uh, benefit to the solidarity in the, in the village level. Because a lot of families, they have some, you know, issues happening, and uh, when the lady visit, they can have the communication. Yeah. So that's some information in China. Great but we are in very early stage. <laughs> I think one mm -hmm. thing I'll say, not just with citizens specific to Asian American, but I think, um, you know, the policies that have been changed, so that telehealth, um, particularly with mental health, I think that's been a real positive, and I think it's allowed for a little 
reduce, you know, allowing for more equity. Um, obviously, there's populations that don't have access, um, you know, to either a phone or a computer where they can actually have virtual um, like counseling sessions. But I think that has been really helpful in access. But I think, as Curtis said, right now, mental health providers are completely booked in terms of, um, particularly if it's with children, it's very difficult to find <coughs> services. Even if you have insurance, it's even worse if you don't have insurance or um, then, then you know, you really are kind of at a disadvantage. So I think it's more, one of the factors is that the supply of workers, I think um, we're just in humongous need. the hardest things with a humongous need and all the needs that we have. But we still have time for additional questions. Sorry. Um, hi, my name is Jessica. I'm a first year uh, master's student at Crown uh, Family School. Um, so I actually worked as a volunteer teacher in like, rural China, and the left behind children was a real issue. Um, like literally, like most of the children there the parents are somewhere else, and they'll come home once a year, so they have to live with their p grandparents and walk like miles in the mountain by themselves to go to school. Um, and that, that's actually one of the reasons that like kind of inspired me to change career and go into social work. Um, but my interest in counseling, so in the future, I kind of am debating like whether I should you know learn more about how to serve youth and children. Um, so I guess. Do any of you have any advice for a aspiring um, social worker in the field? So, thank you. What? Aspiration. <laughs> well, I, well, okay, I'll start. Um, well, I'm very happy that you are at Crown. That is wonderful. Um, and I think that, um, you know, I think as the panel has really kind of spoken, there's a great need. And if you, particularly if you want to go into kind of mental health counseling, I think there is a huge need. I think this is worldwide. Um, even at the global level now, um, global mental health is, is um, something that more people are really becoming interested in. And I think that there is much need to actually disseminate information of what might be evidence-based approaches that work. Um, but at the same time, um, kind of drawing from my own work, the, the, I think you have actually a very unique um, kind of background in the sense that you, you understand what it, um, people from your own culture, also you understand what it means to come to a different country and the struggles that come with it. And so even drawing from your own personal experiences, but also the experiences you've had in your home country and what you will experience here with the population you're working with, that is a great depth in terms of how you can actually serve the populations that may be going through maybe not the exact same, but similar struggles. There's going to be kids who um, have grown up in immigrant families or kids who might be, um, have come here as refugees or as asylees. And this is a new country. They, they have to navigate it. They miss their home country. And I think that's you know, combining kind of your knowledge but also your personal experiences um, here and also from home would really be an asset to those that you'll be serving. Yeah, and multicultural, multilingual, multi-context, mm -hmm. all the strength. I'd More say they talk to, they take Dr. Che's course and then take Dr. Yasui's course <laughs> and then take my course, <laughs> you'll be good to go. <laughs> So that's aspiration. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Johnson's course, Dr. Ma's course, <laughs> Dr. Chaskin's course. We'll welcome additional questions. Yes. Um, so thank you for the great uh, discussion tonight. Uh, my name is Sumin. I'm also a master's student from Crown. I'm an advanced lending student. Um, so from my um, practicum placement, I am doing um, this project to address uh, racial disproportionality in child welfare system. And uh, because our organization is focusing on African-American children, um, they're overrepresented 
in child welfare system. Meanwhile, Asian children are underrepresented. So I wonder if there is any like a possible relationship or connection uh, between like being underrepresented in child welfare system and Asian children's mental distress, and maybe like for you possibly um, how we can address those um, underrepresentation of ch Asian children in child welfare system. Thank you. <laughs> the, the over and under representation thing has, has been known in the child welfare system, just like health disparities are known in the medical care system for many years, and, um, and there's been very little progress made. Um, much, of, most of, much of the research is on overrepresentation of African American kids, and I have not seen any research on mm -hmm. underrepresentation of Asian American kids. Yeah, I, I, so I wouldn't be able to say like why. Um, one, this is just a hypothesis, so I'm just throwing it out there. Um, could be that, particularly when you think about Asian families. Um, the, the strong emphasis on family may actually lend itself to if there is a child in need, that, fam that actually family members, relatives, kin would end up taking care of that child. Um, I think there are instances of children being sent home. So um, among um, immigrant families, if parents are working and they cannot take care of their children, sometimes that their children are then sent back to the home country to be taken care of by grandparents. Um, and so I think that also may be partly of the reason why there might not be a representation. Um, but I, that's just a hypothesis. So um, I worked in Los Angeles that some years ago, but they didn't have the problem of underrepresentation. Um, so it might be just because the, the actual size of the population in the city um, although that's also growing, and Asian Americans are one of the fastest growing racial group in the country. But in California, at least what I have seen is that there's a lot of what you have said that families do cover. They try their best to cover up. And if things happen, they will find a way to sort of amend that problem and address the problem within. So there's a lot of sort of the covering. And, but when there's a marks, like, you know, bruises and whatnot, typically the teachers report, mm -hmm. and the parents get caught. <laughs> and also that as children grow up, you, I mean, as American, they also know how to threaten their parents. Like, if you hit me, I will call the Child Protective Service kind of thing. So it becomes a source of family tensions in the family, too. So they have a whole variety of dramas around it. So, so I think there is underrepresentation, not because somehow they can manage better, but it's more to do with how they have find a way to sort of cover and hide. Um, but when there's a large proportion of population, just like Southern California, there's no problem of underrepresentation. Yeah. So, um, so I also want to share a little bit about. I don't know uh, the the degree, but I think somehow the parent parenting process can give children some information about uh, the limits of right and wrong. So in the China case, uh, if we use like the US definition about child abuse, like uh, slap the face, I think you will define it as abuse, definitely, right? But in, in, in some cases in China, perhaps the parents can say, can argue that I do this because I want you to take the vaccine, which is good for you. So basically this can, this can reconstruct the children's understanding about what is right or wrong in some kind of the families. Um, so that's uh, um, some information I, I'd like to share. And also a student just now mentioned what to learn and to uh, work for the uh, rural child left behind. Actually, from my perspective, we do need a lot of the understanding of the uh, experience, especially practical experience, like the skills to work for those children in need. Um, of course, you need also take some courses to have a better understanding about the different cultures and uh, 
uh, like in different groups in the United States, you have you have more uh, open and diverse background. So um, yeah, this from from t today actually, China I think in the uh, frontier social work uh, services is kind of they just use whatever they can find in terms of the knowledge and also skills. So yeah, but still the more professional and uh, academic training is very important. Thank you. In great mm -hmm. demand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but I also wanted to address uh, what uh, Professor Gao just mentioned too, that one of the major struggles in Southern California with the Asian American families is the sort of the definition uh, differences. So some of the practices that parents use perceived or count as child abuse while the parents would claim that they did it out of their love. Um, so there's a lot of sort of the unclear sort of boundaries of what is the loving, caring discipline versus what is abuse. And actually that has motivated me to study parenting. <laughs> Not that anybody has asked. Um, and it has spent the last 20 years figuring out what's the, sort of the, what's the right thing to do, so to speak. But I think that's also changing even in uh, Eastern countries, that you know what used to constitute as sort of the harsh, not harsh, stern parenting, and as an effective way of parenting may not be um, as effective as anymore. But anyway, so that could be one of the sort of the tricky points. So, given that we have, we are running out of time. Um, I would like to also ask the panelists to have closing remarks. I'm following. Uh, Zing Ma's <laughs> previous <laughs> moderation, that if you have any closing remarks to the, the audience. So this time, let's start with. I'm going to set a high bar for closing remarks. I have none. <laughs> I have none. Anything else? Well, I just wanted to thank you um, for just this opportunity to have this kind of collaborative exchange. I think that, um, you know, learning from one another and particularly as someone who studies how culture in, uh, impacts mental health, it's been a really great opportunity. Um, thank you also for the questions. Um, yeah, and I hope that this dialogue will just continue. Thank you. <coughs> Professor Gao? So I'm here. I think I learn a lot and uh, it's always very important to have the opportunity to communicate and also to learn. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Professor McMillan did not have a closing remarks. If I just revert back to what you um, earlier said, that I think there is so much that we can learn from each country and their own unique circumstances. Why certain countries have the problem when we don't have that problem, but vice versa. So I think this was a great opportunity for that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for a very illuminating discussion, and um, I hope everyone enjoyed this presentation. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you, including our audience, for joining us this evening, and I invite you back here tomorrow at 6 p.m. for the third and the final day of the U.S.-China Forum, which will include a panel discussion on social inequality and policies of inclusion and exclusion in both China and the US. Thank you and have a good evening.